Everyone wants to take their business, their skills, to the next level. Small and mid-sized business owners have exceptional insight into how to do this. They endure and thrive because they find ways to overcome the challenges that come their way, and they can teach us valuable lessons to apply to our own companies and lives. Stephen Nooner, founder and owner of Alkali, a company with a unique process that helps businesses more effectively buy and manage their insurance programs. And Bob Gibbons, builder of Riata Commercial Realty, a real estate advisor and tenant advocate, are two prominent Metroplex businessmen who, along with their weekly guests, will ask their and your probing questions, finding impactful solutions that will help you reach for the next level. Here are your hosts, Stephen Nooner and Bob Gibbons. Welcome to the Next Level, conversations that propel business. I'm your host, Bob Gibbons. And I'm your less abrasive host, Stephen Nooner. Wow, really? (laughs) And I'm excited to introduce our guest today. Uh, My good friend, Kevin Bonfield, is here with us. Kevin is the president of Consenter, uh, a company that aligns elements of IT. And I took this from your website. I thought that was pretty awesome. More than strategy, more than development. It's a new way of thinking about business and technology and it can turn IT into a strategic and competitive advantage. Look wow. forward to learn morning, learning more about that. Uh, Kevin is the uh, best dressed next leveler we've had. Well, so I'm sorry, we, we did have Jessica Nunez. Uh, well, she's the most attractive, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like we? a competition. Yeah, I'm, I'm willing to take <laughs> you that or one Jessica. On. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, to learn more about Kevin, please visit concentergroup.com. That's spelled C O N C E N T R E group.com. Welcome. Thank you. We're glad you're here today. I'm excited. So, we always like to start off with the wisdom of others, and yep. that's just a quote that we, uh, we find. And this week, we actually found one that you gave us. <laughs> it wasn't a long shirt search. It's <laughs> good. George M. Moore, Jr. Who was he? Do you have any idea? I, I don't. I found uh, I found this quote on a postcard uh, okay. I think in, in San Francisco, So, right, but it I'm, looked really good. So, Yeah, it's a great quote. He said, a winner is just a loser who tried one more time. Yeah, I, and I um, I mean, a lot of people have heard the Vince Lombardi quote, right? You, we didn't lose. We just ran out of time. But uh, this one to me is all about persistence, right? It's, uh, it, it's, it's really about what entrepreneurialism is. And it's, you've just got to keep on going at it. You've got to be persistent, keep moving, even when others probably would have given up. And um, at my lowest times, this, this is, a, by the way, this is a quote at my desk in my office. It's right above my screen, so I see it every day. Um, it's, the, it's one of the things that uh, kind of resets me and drives me forward. You know, I, I heard about a study several years ago where they took the very top uh, salespeople in, mm-hmm. a, in organizations, big organizations, and compared them to everybody else. And the single best or single most common uh, reason for why they were more successful was because at the end of the day, when everybody was leaving, they made one more call. Yeah. And that was it. It's so yeah. simple. We don't have enough time on the show, but for another day, a story of the worst salesperson I've ever met that was the most successful purely because of activity. Yeah. Did you, did you ever see, um, was it The Pursuit of Happiness? It yes. had Will Smith yeah. in it? Yeah. And, and he worked out basically that he was going to drink less water because that meant that he was going to go to the bathroom less and he was going to make more calls as a result. I mean, that, that was <laughs> based on a true story. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was yeah. awesome. Yeah. So, Kevin, tell us something about yourself that maybe not everyone knows. And it can't be I'm British. <clears throat> People haven't worked like that out shoes. already. I, I, they, they ask me where I'm from, <laughs> and I'll say, well, it's, you know, it's east of Dallas. Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, um, so there's, there's, there's a few things that I think people don't know. Um, I've slept on six continents. Okay. Um, so not just visited, I've actually slept, I think in most cases I've, I've spent up to a week there. Um, the one I've not done is Antarctica. That's still on my, still on my list. Um, I love flying from London to Dallas and that's partly, a uh, that's partly for me a, I get to go home, but there are very few times now when I just have time when somebody's not going to bug me. And I can get work done, mm-hmm. and that's just about a long enough flight that to be able to do that. Um, so the one I'm curious about is what what is a 1204 plank? Is that literally like planking? Yeah, it's planking. So um, I, I I like I, I like physical activities that are a combination of physical and mental. So I you know I run half marathons, 
uh, I've done a triathlon. Th- this to me is um, self torture. It's it's a little bit like that. Yeah. Uh, and so my my trainer, I've known my trainer for about ten years now, and he has a series of competitions in his across his uh, uh, across his uh, customers, mm-hmm. and one of them is the plank. And so I think it was two years ago, I won the I won the first competition with a five minute plank, and then uh, earlier this year. He got a much wider range of people involved, uh-huh. and and, uh, and they came in. They was they were starting to do like seven minute thirty planks, eight minute planks, right? And um, and it was it was actually a, a really tough time for me at, at that point. It was it was earlier on in the year, and I, I almost didn't try to defend my my title, but uh, I just worked out back to the persistence thing that I am willing to suffer more than other people. And, uh, <laughs> That's a big part of it. And, and so, yeah, it is. It, 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 become, it becomes mental, right? You, you, have to, you have to be taking the pain out of your body. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I found in the end, actually, that the best way to win was just to, to have a, a really long time very early in the competition so people gave up. Okay, right? so after so our 12 break, or 4 holds... Sorry, twelve or four? Yeah, I've got I've got like a little uh, a little okay. plaque in my office. Nice. Right? So the second half of our show is twelve minutes. Is that right? So we're so gonna do that when you in a plank. plank. Yeah. You'll be in the plank the whole time. <laughs> did Did I tell you that I don't speak very much during the, <laughs> <laughs> during the plank? That's your next. Bob game. has no problem with that. <laughs> All right, let's let's see if we can get back to a business show. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> we we uh, all right. So Concenter Group. Yeah. Uh, so tell us what exactly is Concenter Group and how are you different than your competition. Sure. So um, we work with uh, we work with CIOs and technology functions, uh, basically to help them translate strategy into results, strategy into uh, into execution. And so uh, we we uh, we kind of fit in the management consulting space, mm-hmm. uh, but we don't really think of ourselves as as consultants as much. We're more um, you know coaches and and people that you sit alongside and work with. So we. We don't tend to think about our work as projects. We we tend to to think about it more in terms of what's the outcome you're trying to get to, and we will help you get there. We sit alongside you. We work with you. We collaborate. Um, we we help you. We teach you how to fish, right? So it's not just here's what you need to do, but we'll actually model it with you and then turn it over um, so that you can go and execute that on an ongoing basis. And so, so are you are you, are you you buying hardware and software and all that kind of thing? Or no, you... no. So we, we, we tend away from, while we talk about working in the technology space, we're really not, um, we're not developers. We don't have managed services or anything like that. It's, it's really much more around strategy, uh, operations, process, and, uh, and helping like I say, helping technology functions become more efficient. And, and, and it's really, the, the, the reason it's important to me is that in, in working with them over the last, uh, I suppose it's about 15 years, typically, typically all of the bad decisions that have happened within a company, all of the symptoms kind of, symptoms kind of make their way to the technology function, right? So if you don't, if you don't really have a, a purpose or a plan, uh, that shows up as as changing priorities and new projects, and you've got to get this done tomorrow happening in the technology function. And so it's as much about helping those guys be successful. So you have a little bit different typical client than our, our – Yeah. Our, so tell us about who's your typical client, and then how do they know that they need to hire you? Um, so, yeah, we, we typically work with, with large companies, so Fortune 1000 and above. Um, I think the smallest we've done – uh, the smallest company we've worked with was about a billion in revenue. Mm-hmm. Um, typically, we also look at the IT budget. So, you know, fifty, sixty million dollars of, of spend in, in technology is is on the low end for us. Um, and so, so yeah, we we engage with them. Um, we t- like I say, we tend to have much longer projects with them. So we we will work with companies for for years uh, because that's typically how long it takes them to to get into that better spot. How do they know they need you, though? Oh, yeah. sorry. How do they know that they need us? You know, it, it's um, it's it's a it's a challenge of of actually getting our name out there as as much as anything. So, um, one of one of the challenges of our space is that everybody knows. Uh, you know, I need a, a development company, or I need some project managers, program managers, uh, and. A lot of companies have done very well at being those, you know, those domain experts and being vertical. Mm-hmm. And we essentially act as an integrator, kind of the, the the horizontal glue, if you will, that brings it together. And so it, it tends to be, um, you know, people who've had those problems before. Uh, it's it's new CIOs who are trying to trying to set a new course, and it's companies that. 
uh, it's companies that um, are facing some kind of inflection point. They what's what's made them successful previously isn't going to make them successful in the future, and 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 that's when they they tend to reach out to us. And is there? I mean, so how good are these companies? I mean, because we serve a lot smaller sure. market, right, yeah. under a thousand employee, nowhere near that yeah. size. So just out of curiosity, how good are they at recognizing that they? need to outside help. I mean, mm -hmm. it seems to me a billion dollar company is like, oh, well, we'll just throw more resources at more, it and keep it people. internal, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, and yeah, so mo most of our, uh, most of our leads come uh, through people that we've worked with before, but precisely because of that, because it's, it's not a, it's not a well, well understood space really. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I actually, you know, you, you, you raise the, just throw more resources at it. Uh, often that gets companies into into more trouble, right? Sure. Because they're just they're just overweighting the amount of uh, production work, if you will, and it's not generating any better results. So the if if you don't have the system set up the right way, then the the more that you try and push through it, you're actually you're, you're actually getting a lot of result. Hole. <laughs> yeah, I mean it, it just doesn't you don't or get a deeper hole. Yeah, you you don't get the results on the back end. Well, right? if they're already s spending fifty to sixty million dollars a year in their IT, what's yeah. you know what's another few million but, exactly but in that situation are you not finding that are you not threatening to the it infrastructure within that organization um it, it look it, it it can certainly feel that way come you know when we first come in sure. I, I think that there's always a hey we've we've done fine up until now um what 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 we found is that as we as we start to sit down because we, because we literally do become part of it, it, we're kind of like the team like part of the team um, after a while it becomes much more collaborative and we and we get to work uh, you know we get to work alongside uh, alongside them so that they can be successful so it, yes I mean in in any situation where you've got new people coming in it's a bit of a challenge um, but uh, we've we've found that once we get going we're um, we're, we're viewed as partners rather than, you know, additional resource that's there telling you what to do. So just out of curiosity, yeah. talking scale, I mean, your business is your people essentially. Right. Yeah, so yeah. how do you, how do you go about attracting and retaining the right people for projects like that? Yeah. I mean, so, uh, we look for, we, we actually look for people who've had uh, a mixture of experiences. So people who've been in consulting, Mm -hmm. um, and then people who've actually sat in the seat. So I've done. I've been a CIO um, on an interim basis. There are people on my team who've run large technology functions. Uh, people who've been business analysts, program managers, managed accounts. And so the the thing that we can bring is is not just hey, this is the theoretical way that we would think about it, but hey, we've sat in your seat. We can we can look round corners. We can see where your problems are going to be, not just where they are, and. That practicality comes through in terms of the way that we uh, that we drive to results. And I guess whenever you're dealing with this kind of engagement, you've really got to. I mean, you mentioned earlier, CIO is the position that you're mainly Typically, interacting yes, with. Exactly. But don't you have to get buy-in even above that? Yeah. Um, so for for us to for us to be able to you know take that that strategy to execution, often we have to work back up into the business because uh, it, it becomes clear early on that actually there's not a business plan that lays out what they want to do first and then second and then third, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, and and like like I said, that's why the symptoms show up in the technology function. I mean, you always assume that the bigger the company, the more sophisticated they are in their planning, but it sounds like that may not necessarily be the case. It's it's uh, my experience that, uh, that that's not always the case. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Give us details and specifics. <laughs> Which stock should we dump? <laughs> All right, so we're going to go to a break before we do. Plan, it is said often, plan your success or you have already planned your failure, right? What do you do when your leadership is not aligned on what your 10 year target of your business should be? Stick around and we'll learn from Kevin. And now, confessions of a recovering landlord. This is Bob Gibbons with Riata Commercial Realty, and I am your recovering landlord. After 20 years as a landlord, I now use that experience only for the benefit of companies that lease or buy office buildings and warehouses. Today's confession, knowledge is power. We all negotiate from a position of power and strength, or at least we want to. In any negotiation, the party with the most knowledge probably has the upper hand. And landlords count on this being the case whenever uh, you're negotiating a lease because most landlords are professional real estate investors and they hire professional leasing agents and property managers. Landlords are in the market every day negotiating leases while tenants probably only negotiate one, maybe two leases every few years. So tenants feel outgunned. Don't let landlords have all the power. 
As a former landlord for 20 years, I understand how landlords think and what motivates them. So let me put that knowledge and experience to work on your side of the negotiation. To learn more, contact me at texastenantrep.com. Again, that's texastenantrep.com. Have you started making plans to take your business to the next level in 2016? Hi, I'm Stephen Nooner, founder and CEO of Alkali. We have a trademark process called the Empowered Advantage that enables CEOs, business owners, and entrepreneurs to more effectively buy and manage their insurance. Before sitting down to make your plans for the new year, here are just a few things to consider. Would you say that you have an actual insurance strategy, one that you can articulate, or have you just purchased a policy here and there over the years? If you have an insurance strategy, was it discussed under the pressure of a renewal deadline or considered earlier in the year to avoid fire drill decision making? If your answer was no to either of these questions, then you may not have the right partner on your team. Visit AlkaliServices.com to contact us and take the next step to a bigger and better future. Hi, I'm Dr. Jay Woody, Founder and Chief Medical Officer at Legacy ER and Urgent Care of North Texas, and we're excited about providing fair billing for all of our patients. I was told that an interview with Bob and Stephen would feel like an interrogation at Guantanamo Bay. That was sound advice. Welcome back to The Next Level, conversations that propel business. We are here with our guest, Kevin Bonfield of Consenter Group. And if you want to know more about them, you can go to consentergroup.com, and that's C-O-N-C-E-N-T-R-E group.com. Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so before the, the break, we were talking about how you serve these giant companies, right. Fortune 1000, et cetera. So your company itself is, you know, what, 15, 18 people how do you jump into that space uh, as a company? And I mean, how did you get to that point? So, you know, my my career had started with Bain and Company. I was a management consultant for five years. I worked for a couple of small startups, and then uh, and then I went to work for EDS uh, for for seven years, and, and did a whole range of things there uh, in the application space, uh, offshore. Uh, state and local government, and um, it was at the end of that time HP had bought EDS, and uh, I uh, we we came to a we came to a mutual agreement that it was time for me to go and uh, do something else, and I was excited to go on a on an entrepreneurial journey, and that's how Consenta started. So you already had that experience dealing with those size exactly customers. So doing it from a smaller platform really wasn't any different it was just a different platform it, it was a different platform i, I you know I, I think the experience that you get working in those kinds of companies uh is very translatable and and um uh you know and our clients recognize that that's part of the the value proposition you bring it's not it's not that you are a small company of 15 people it's that you have this broad experience and now that we're in a in a, in a smaller company we've got a very clear way of applying that experience to you yeah, it seems like there's always that fear of young I mean, small companies trying to work with the giant companies, yeah. they feel like they're not able to compete or mm -hmm. whatever. In fact, I went to something from the uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, Plano Chamber of Commerce recently, where they brought in some really large, large companies here mm -hmm. in the DFW area, uh, specifically to talk about how small companies can do business with them. Right. And the very first comment uh, was, it's really difficult dealing with these giant companies, mm. and are you really ready for that? You need to ask yourself that before you actually start trying to work with them. And, and don't get me wrong, there's, there's, there's certainly challenges on the way in, right? I mean, dealing with, uh, you know, dealing with vendor management functions, procurement, uh, you know, getting all of your contracts in place, and then making sure that, uh, making sure that you invoice and get paid on time. Absolutely, that 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 is a challenge. Um, but I, I think that there's. Uh, th there's something that comes from smaller companies working with with larger ones, and it's that you get uh, you get the uh, maybe a slightly more innovative way of looking at things because it's not constrained by a big company. This is the way that we do things, mm -hmm. and because those because those bigger clients are, are so important, typically you you know you are consistently bringing your A game and your and your A players to that relationship rather than uh, you know. I, you know, we'll give them a, a B team and, and see if they notice the difference. And so we've we found that which that, happens, which happens, right? And, and so we found that that's worked out very well for us because uh, because we bring uh, we bring a great team every time. I totally get that. So let, let's take it down a bit. So because mm -hmm. a lot of the people listening to the show are, are you know not billion dollar companies, um, although we welcome them. They're but, all listening. Yeah, they're all listening. They just right? don't tell us. But the, <laughs> just out of curiosity, let, let's take this down to you know a company would couple hundred employees what um, what are the things that are translatable that that 
leadership needs to be asking themselves in, in regards to technology? Sure. I mean, I, I, one of the one of the great things is that I get to work with large companies and 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 bring all of that experience that I had through my through my career, and yet also have the fun of being an entrepreneur and right. starting something from scratch. And uh, and so th- there are a number of things which uh, you know that we 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 take from the larger company to the smaller company. And I would mm-hmm. tell you that uh, there are things that I take from the way that. Uh, my family runs into business and vice versa as well. And so there's things like, um, you know, we've we've really spent a lot of time focused on values within Consenta because mm-hmm. it's important for us um, uh, be- – you, you can't hide in a 15-person company, right? I right. mean, you, you, it's not like, it's pretty yeah, tough. you know, Bob's over in the corner and you and I'll get on and that's fine because we never have to talk to him. No, we're, we're, all, we're all together and we're Large all in family. this, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's really important that we've got that, that consistency across values. And so we've spent a lot of time um, not only laying out what those values are, but then uh, highlighting them in, in meetings, like who's, who's got a great example of where somebody's shown um, how that value has worked for them. We use it to evaluate people on the way into our company. We use them to evaluate how people are performing within our company. Um, so it's, that's that's a critical piece for us. And how does that filter down in a smaller company into technology ch- choices? Because yep. to me, the te- technology is a, a tremendous equalizer. I mean, right. it, it definitely allows small companies to play on bigger stages. Sure. So, but how do you, how does that translate? Sure. So, so think about technology is not a a giant scary thing that that happens behind the curtain right. i mean te- technology really is about uh really is about people i i was at the um uh, the cio hall of fame awards uh, about a month ago in california and there were there were six inductees who got up and spoke uh and i think five of them talked about people wow. like the, the the difference that was made in their in their career was the was the people that were involved so it, it's it's about people right and so um you know, if I give you an example, one of our values is authentic, empathetic, and caring, right? Okay. And so that actually translates very well for um, for our clients as well, because you've got to be you've got to be clear with people, you've got to be upfront, um, you've got to care about their success, and part of that means that um, that you don't sweep issues under the rug. We try and bring them forward. We have them on uh, have them on the table. And if you don't do that in a technology function, then you get to the point where projects are running off uh, off course, right? You've got outages, and nobody knows why they happened. And if you do that in a small company, then you then you just get this. Uh, this uh, um, you know underlying degradation of the team if you if you don't feel like you're there uh, all for one. Hmm. Just start missing. Go ahead. So Stephen, you you uh, ask a question before the break, uh, what we call the hook. Yeah. Uh, would you repeat that for us and let's let's head that down you that direction. Ask the question, uh, the the hook again. Yeah. All right. So I mean, um, <laughs> plan your success or you've already planned your failure. What do you do when your leadership is not aligned? on what the 10 year target of your business should be. So Kevin, does that sound familiar at all? It, it does a little. Um, <laughs> so uh, I suppose it was about 18 months ago, uh, we, we started to use a system uh, within our company called EOS, the Entrepreneur's Operating System. I, my guess is that you've heard of this before. It's maybe yes. talked about it a couple of times. <laughs> uh, and so th- that was great for us getting our leadership team together and saying, where do we want to be in 10 years, three years, one year? Um, the three-year one for us was actually a, a, a real crystallizing point because it was close enough that you could actually feel it and see it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was far enough away that you could tell that there were going to be some big changes that would come if, you were, if we were going to get there. And so uh, when we first sat down with our leadership team, we talked about what that three-year plan would be. And we got it down on paper. We walked out of the room and said, yes, okay, we're in. That's what three years looks like. Uh, and it became clear over the next three, four months that some people were more in than others, right? Mm. And, and that didn't come up in the meeting. It didn't. It didn't. Um, and so, uh, you know, I don't like to go, I don't like to go back on decisions that we've made unless there's new data, right? Sure. Because otherwise you're just, you're just, you know, delaying the execution of, uh, of the decision you've already made. Right. And so we talked about, is there new data that we should bring to this conversation? And the new data was, um, Yes, it would be helpful for us to understand what the ranges were uh, in terms of revenue, what we thought revenue might look like in three years uh, individually, if, you know, if we were to go around the table, right? So um, you might say that, yeah, my range was 10 to 20 million, and you might say my range was 20 to 30 million. So we agreed on 20, right? But you're kind of thinking, yeah, we're not moving fast enough, and you're thinking, 
gosh, we're, we're going too fast, right? And so we, we looked at all of the ranges, and it um, uh, while there was an overlap, it became clear that there was going to be some tension within the leadership as, uh, leadership team as a result. And, um, you know, shortly or, or later on that year, uh, later on la- last year, October, November time, uh, there were members of our, of our management team who said, look, we, we're not in on, on that uh, as a as a three year plan, and it's time for us to go and do uh, our own thing. And so, the, the the in the short term, obviously that's very painful, right? Sure. I mean, you've got members of your management team, uh, leadership team who uh, who decide to go and do something else. Mm. At the same time, that is part of the system, right? I mean, EOS is very clear on uh, get alignment, and we do this with our clients, right? Get alignment on where you're going, and be clear and make sure that everybody's in and everybody. Um, everybody wasn't in, and so we lost a, a number of members of our leadership team. That was uh, that was a real challenge for us. Just out of curiosity, what, was the uh, not alignment that the the tendency was that it was too high or too low from the perspective that the people left? Um, that it was too high. Okay. It's too high. So uh, one of our values, coming back to values, one of our values is being practically optimistic. Mm-hmm. Um, I tend to be on the optimistic side. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and there are others who are more on the practical side, and they, they bring me back into the middle, and I kind of, put, kind of push them up to the other end. But, yeah, that's uh, – uh, we'd 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 gotten we'd widened that too far. There was too much optimism apparently for some people, but I'm still going back to it. So let me nail this down just slightly more. Yeah. Uh, so when they're thinking you're growing too fast or your 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 projections are too high, mm-hmm. is that really translating to I don't want to work that hard? No, I don't think it was a I don't think it was a hard work. I, I honestly think that it was a um, just couldn't see the vision of how to get there. Couldn't couldn't see the couldn't see the path to it. And then also, I think that they um, that there was much more of a, a view of uh, how am I going to provide that kind of service to my clients and to bring my team along if we're growing that quickly. Uh, and uh, you know, I I think that they felt more comfortable in something that that was a that was slower growth. Uh, and I I would have to tell you that. Uh, one of the things that I love about sitting at this intersection of large companies and being an entrepreneur is uh, that we get to go and do big things, and that's what I'd like to go do. So you're you're closer to that three years. I'm I'm I am closer to that three who, years who on the right? optimistic side. Oh no, we've still got two years, so I am I am going at it. So, but it's lo- but looking uh, like that's still the right on path. track or off track. Uh, <laughs> uh, gosh, that's a tough story. <laughs> really? <laughs> um, look, I would I would say that uh, that we are on track, and we've still got a lot of work to do. What's next? What's next? Um, we're finishing up the foundation for the company. There's the, there were a number of things we found this year where we we basically had to get um, people. And, and partners in place that we're going to grow with us over the next 10 years. And, and that was, you know, banks, lawyers, um, uh, you know, CFO help. We needed that to be able to take ourselves from here to, to, the, to our three-year plan. And, and we've changed a lot of those relationships in the, in the last year, and it's been very helpful for us. Well, we appreciate you coming on the show today, Thank sharing you. with us your, uh, your experiences. Uh, for the listeners, if you'd like to learn more about Concenter Group, please go to concenter.com. I'm sorry, concentergroup.com, and that's C-O-N-C-E-N-T-R-E group.com. If you want to know more about the show, please go to nextlevelshow.com. If you heard something that, you know, someone else would find value in, please help spread the word, share, share it on Facebook, social media, et cetera, and have a great week. See you next week. You have been listening to The Next Level, conversations that propel business with Stephen Nooner and Bob Gibbons. Join us every Tuesday at 1.30 p.m. for more prolific conversations that will take your business to the next level.